Sunday at 12:30 p.m. only on Bloomberg Quint. Good morning. You're watching Daybreak on Bloomberg Quint Live and I'm Alex Matthew. First the headlines this morning. Asian stocks extended declines after concerns over corporate earnings and a base metal collapse. The MSCI Emerging Market Index has now fallen close to 20% from its January high. Prime Minister Narendra Modi announces the launch of the Ayushman Bharat scheme in his Independence Day address. The mission will be launched on September 25th this year. Kotak Mahindra Bank will be in focus today after the Reserve Bank of India rejected the lender's uh, promoter uh, stake dilution plan. And Blackstone Group is in talks to buy stake in the loyalty program of Jet Airways. That's a Bloomberg exclusive. And the flood situation in Kerala remains grim. Death toll so far has risen to 67. The Kochi airport has shut operations till Saturday. Now let's first look at the international markets and there was a broad sell-off uh, yesterday uh, and Wall Street extended declines on Wednesday with the S&P 500 posting its biggest percentage drop since late June as investors turned risk averse on disappointing earnings and escalator, uh, escalating global tariff worries. Abigail Doolittle of Bloomberg News tells you everything that happened in this report. Stocks declined in Wednesday's Wall Street session. The Dow fell by about half a percent. The S&P 500 was down three quarters of one percent, while the tech-heavy Nasdaq underperformed down 1.2 percent. Now, behind this uh, risk-off session, fears around Turkey, China, and trade. Connected to it, the commodity complex. The Bloomberg Commodity Index tumbled 1.9 percent, its worst day in more than a month. Now, officially in a correction from its recent high, down more than down 10 percent, more than 10 percent. Uh, from its recent high as oil, copper, platinum, gold, commodities right across the board are falling. Some of this, much of it, has to do with fears that emerging markets could be hurt by the crisis in Turkey and the trade war with China, that demand in the emerging markets uh, could wane and in that would hurt demand for the commodity complex. Now, tech was another piece of it as related to China, considering that Tencent, the Chinese internet social media giant, they put up a disappointing quarter. That weighed on lots of the other companies, Alibaba, JD.com, Baidu. Plus, it also weighed on the American gamers, Electronic Arts, Activision, and Take-Two, considering that it was regulatory uncertainty around Tencent's gaming segment that really weighed on those results. And as if all of that weren't enough, Macy's weighed on the consumer discretionary space. In fact, all the department stores were lower. Macy's down 16%. It's worse day in more than a year after actually beating, but this came on increased expenses. Investors not liking that, thinking that e-commerce is still a pressure. We also, on this, of course, saw the likes of Nordstrom, Kohl's, and JCPenney sell off, even Target selling off uh, in that consumer discretionary pullback on the day, driven by Macy's. And confirming it was risk-off, Haven Bonds in the end did rally in Wednesday's risk-off session. In New York, Abigail did little Bloomberg News. Now, Abigail did mention a little bit about Turkey, but let me tell you a little more about it. Turkey fired the latest salvo on Wednesday in its growing confrontation with the Trump administration by imposing heavy tariffs on products imported from the United States, including cars, alcohol and tobacco. The move comes in less than a week after President Donald Trump announced that he would increase duties on steel and aluminium from Turkey. Now, Turkish officials retaliated with the new duties on nearly two dozen U.S. goods. Yusuf Gamal Eldin of Bloomberg News has all the details in this report. Well, we had a cascade of important speeches. We heard from the president, again, very combative, as you pointed out, saying that Turkey is an economy under siege and pointing basically the finger on the United States, that they are responsible for attacking economies around the world. Now, that combative rhetoric has been beefed up with a very clear response from the Turkish government. I want to run you through exactly what these tariffs amount to. You're looking at a decree that basically puts an additional 50 percent tax on U.S. rice. 140 percent on spirits, so that means man, it's that Jack Daniels that you like to get more expensive, and 120 percent on cars. 
Uh, the relationship with the U.S. in terms of trade is an important one. They're the fourth largest trade partner, and it comes in a broader signaling that they're doing that they are willing to move away from this historic NATO alliance or at least explore other friendships. We had the Russian foreign minister in town yesterday, and today we understand there are going to be meetings with the leadership of Qatar. So, again, underscoring that this is far from settled, this dispute with the United States. Now, after that uh, report was filed, there was actually uh, more details that emerged from that meeting with the Qatar officials. The Turkish lira, in fact, rallied against the dollar after it emerged that Qatar could invest as much as $15 billion into the country. Qatar's Emir Sheikh Tamim bin Hamad bin uh, Al Thani uh, made the pledge after a three and a half hour meeting with Erdogan in Ankara on Wednesday. Now, we're joined live by David Inglis in Hong Kong, and we're hoping that he can give us a little bit of clarity going into trade today, uh, just ahead of uh, trade in India. Uh, David, the last time we spoke, we were looking for a little more uh, of news or updates from Turkey. It seems like that uh, dispute is going to be a little more protracted. Uh, uh, so how are we looking at the markets? Uh, what are we reading uh, towards the end of this week? Right. I mean, uh, first things first, I would set Turkey aside for the moment uh, for the simple reason, as, as, as what you just mentioned, that, I mean, nothing fundamentally has changed, really. I mean, it, it's continuing to get worse, at least fortunately, though, uh, for markets, is that at least that story, when you look at the lira, for example, it started to diverge from EMs. Now, the other side of it, it, it doesn't really matter because EMs today um, are under different kinds of pressure uh, altogether. Lots of happening, uh, lots of moving parts, in fact, in these last five minutes or so. Let me take you through some of the headlines here. So, as far as equities go, it's a very bad day. Uh, here in the Asia Pacific, which obviously doesn't bode well for, for the India Open later on. Um, a few things have happened, though. Um, let me start with the negatives here. We talked about Tencent. Uh, it was out with earnings yesterday, quite a bad set of numbers. Uh, I won't get into the details because it's been uh, quite analyzed uh, quite, quite deeply already and comprehensively. Now, that said, when you look at the stock price now, uh, we're down about 5%. Now, just keep in mind, that's the biggest. It's the heaviest weighted stock on the Emerging Markets Index. So when that moves, that tends to uh, cause quite a bit of damage here uh, to the broader index. In fact, because of, of the drop that we saw in Tencent yesterday and this one today, we're actually now in a bear market for emerging market equities. And as you would imagine, you get that drop, and then you have other shares that are uh, you sort of, because of market structure, you sort of get forced selling as well. I mean, Samsung. Uh, is one of them in South Korea. That, that market is down uh, substantially as well today. The cost being index, 1.4%. Now, you have another heavily weighted stock, TSMC, also within the Emerging Markets Index, that obviously when you get flows out of these ETFs, a lot of the managers will have to sell and sort of pare down their holdings proportionately. And what you get is what we're getting today, a bear market. Uh, the other thing I do want to mention, though, is, is, is when you look at some of the sort of risk on uh, uh, catalyst and, and one of a big one actually came just a few minutes ago. Um, I read headline here that the Chinese Vice Commerce Minister, in speaking of trade, uh, will be visiting the U.S. for trade talks. Now, that's all we know so far. It's a headline. Uh, it did enough to, to move the needle a little bit when you look at some of these risk assets, for example. We're still down, but the likes, say, of, of, of dollar China is, is down substantially. Following that, you're getting a little bit more weakness as well coming through in the Japanese currency. So uh, we're getting sort of two big opposing forces pulling. At the moment, uh, I have to say it's still very much risk off. So that's, that's the sort of state of play as, as I guess you guys make your way and count down to your open there mm -hmm. in India. Thank you so much for that, David. And speaking about open in India, uh, I'm joined now by Agam Vakil, and he's here to set you up for the day's trade and to tell you what's happening in the futures and options space in India. Agam, well, just very simply, coming back from a midweek holiday, a lot's happened across the globe. What are we looking at on Thursday? Well, Alex, Al David already mentioned, we're looking at some amount of weakness considering the drop in the uh, Asian equity markets. And that's uh, it's likely to see pressure on the SGX Nifty. It's already evident, as you can see, a drop around 47 points at this point in time. Uh, let's talk about trade last Tuesday and see how things panned out there. And we did see strength out there. But it seems, that at least in terms of opening, this strength is likely to wait away 
Uh, in terms of uh, well, the mid cap and the small cap indices too, we are looking at some amount of weakness coming through. Uh, and uh, of course, the Nifty and the PSU banking indices did advance as well last Tuesday. Uh, but we're going to have to wait and watch for whether or not these indices as well uh, see perhaps some amount of pressure as we move into trade. But among the few uh, other sectors did, which did do well, we did have advances on Nifty Pharma, essentially on the back of that 7% up move in Sun Pharma and the Nifty Media Index also advancing, well, to a certain extent reversing some of the losses that we saw on Monday for that index. But let's move on, take a look at the ADRs picture. And as one might expect, we are seeing some amount of weakness here. So Vedanta dropping by another 3%. Tata Motors, Wipro and Dr. Reddy's also declining in trade. Uh, in other ADRs which are listed, we've seen more weakness. Infosys perhaps the only one which has seen marginally uh, uh, declining moves out there. But um, uh, when it comes to foreign institution flows, again, not too much to speak for, considering the gross numbers themselves were, were, were not very large. Uh, FIs did sell around 379 crores worth of stock. On the other hand, DI is buying nearly the same amount. Of course, on a net basis. Now, on uh, Tuesday, we did see Reliance Industries, ICICI Bank, and Sun Pharma, along with Axis Bank, contribute uh, to the gains in the Nifty, whereas uh, there really wasn't too much to speak for when it comes to those which are bearing down on the indices, LNT and HDFC, perhaps to a certain extent. And that, with that, let's take a look at the futures and options space. Well, we did see a little bit of a turnaround. Uh, when considering we were seeing so much unwinding, there were, there were few longs uh, taken when it comes to the futures. Uh, that's the Nifty futures and the Nifty banking futures, however, continue to see unwinding when it comes to its uh, open interest. Uh, moving on, when it comes to Chi, uh, with your open interest distribution, that still remains the same. It's the 11,000 put and the 11,500 call, which gives you a rough range within which you can expect the Nifty to move within in the near term but when it comes to changes in open interest it was 11,400 which saw more writing and along with that 11,500 which remains the most active option uh, considering we saw a little bit of unwinding in the that that specific call as well but uh, the nifty put call ratio once again is higher at around 1.7 uh, and the nifty banking put call ratio as well is up higher to around 1.14 now uh, taking a look at Apollo Hospitals, this is the one which continues to rise. And we've seen, while we've seen unwinding in open interest here, there's some uh, f fresh longs building up uh, in, in, the, in the next few series. But, uh, uh, but along with the, you know, Apollo Hospitals, we've also seen page industries move up around 30 to around well over the mark of 33,000, fresh longs there. And finally, let's bring, bring up something like Balkrishna Industries. That's a 9% up move out there. 21% are in the open interest. So a lot of stocks out there that have seen strength, and Alex, it remains to be seen whether or not some of these stocks will see some amount of profit booking today. Mm. All right. Well, stocks definitely in focus, the equity markets. Uh, thanks so much for that, Agam, by the way. So equity markets uh, definitely in focus uh, today, uh, considering the kind of global moves that we've had. But another focus is clearly going to be on the Indian currency. The Indian rupee is on a weak wicket Yet again, on Tuesday, it notched up a record for the first time in the history of independent India. It sank below the 70 per a mark against the, the US dollar. However, it recovered from the all-time low of 70.08 and closed at 69.90 against the dollar at, later on in the same session. Now, the rupee has been on a downward slide uh, in 2018. It has depreciated by more than 10% so far. Uh, and also, on April 1 this year, when India's financial year began, it went down by almost 6.7%, earning the tag of the worst performing currency in Asia in 2018. That tag still holds true. Now, Kotak Mahindra Bank's plan to dilute promoter stake has not passed muster with the Reserve Bank of India. Remember, RBI's banking guidelines require Uday Kotak to cut stake in the private lender, and, and Kotak chose the non-convertible preference share route for the stake sale. Vishwanath Nair has all the latest in this report. The Reserve Bank of India has rejected Kotak Mahindra Bank's plan to reduce a promoter's stake in the bank. 
uh, now according to what the RBI has said uh, is that this uh, the route that uh, Kotak Mahindra Bank has taken uh, to reduce uh, the stake of the promoters in the bank is not in, in line with what the RBI wants uh, the promoters to do. Essentially, uh, Kotak Mahindra Bank raised about 500 crore uh, through the issue of uh, perpetual non-convertible uh, preference shares and what they intended to do was that bring down the promoter stake to below 20% uh, in the paid up capital of the bank. However, the equity share capital uh, side of the story, there the stake still remains at about 30%. Uh, so the dichotomy there was whether uh, the guidelines uh, are being met in letter and spirit or whether whether the RBI would approve this or not. And that debate has now been settled with the RBI now completely rejecting uh, the, uh, the Kotak Mahindra Bank's plan uh, for issuance of, uh, of these uh, share, uh, preference shares and thereby reducing the promoter's stake. Uh, the bank says that it believes it has completely uh, met with all the guidelines and that it will be uh, talking to the Reserve Bank of India and trying to get them to uh, get on board with their plan. All right, uh, you'll find all the details on that story on the website BloombergQuinn.com. But moving on to coverage of the country's 72nd Independence Day celebration, Prime Minister Narendra Modi addressed the nation in his fifth and last speech for his current term. Here are a few highlights. इस देश के 10 करोड़ परिवार ये प्रारंभिक हैं आने वाले दिनों में निम्न मध्यम वर्ग मध्यम वर्ग उच्च मध्यम वर्ग उसको भी इसका लाभ मिलने वाला है हर परिवार को 5 लाख रुपया सालाना ये हेल्थ एश्योरेंस देने की योजना है आज 15 अगस्त से आने वाले 4 5 6 सप्ताह इस टेक्नोलॉजी का टेस्टिंग शुरू हो रहा है और फिर 25 सितंबर पंडित दीनदयाल उपाध्याय की जन्म जयंती पर पूरे देश में यह प्रधानमंत्री जन आरोग्य अभियान लॉन्च कर दिया जाएगा हमारे लिए सुप्रीम है रूल ऑफ लॉ उस पर कोई कॉम्प्रोमाइज नहीं हो सकता है किसी को भी कानून हाथ में लेने का हक नहीं दिया जा सकता है 2022 जब आजादी के 75 साल होंगे तब हम मानव सहित गगनयान लेकर के चलेंगे और ये गगनयान जब अंतरिक्ष में जाएगा तब विश्व के अंदर हम चौथे देश बन जाएंगे जो मानव को अंतरिक्ष में पहुंचाने वाले बन जाएंगे now, out of all of the things that you heard uh, Prime Minister Modi say, uh, he also said in his speech that the National Health Care Mission will cover 10 crore families when it is launched nationwide on the 25th of September. We caught up with the man behind the scenes, Indu Bhushan, who is the CEO of Ayushman Bharat, to get a better picture of what it is all about. Listen in. This pilot is basically to test out our systems. And uh, when I say systems, it's uh, largely the uh, our uh, software that we're using for identifying the beneficiaries and also for managing the transactions. So we are actually starting this pilot in 14 provinces, uh, 14 states, and uh, that uh, has started. And uh, in a couple of weeks, we'll also include other states. And uh, so we want to continue this uh, pilot uh, in all states who have signed on uh, and so that they're ready to launch on 25th of September. Uh, well, there's not too much time between the pilot uh, and your launch date of September 25th. Is it enough to test your systems and are we running a little behind schedule, uh, Mr. Bhushan? Well, we are not behind schedule. Actually, had we wanted, we could have launched the scheme in a few states already. Uh, and uh, this, uh, uh, the software that we've used is from Telangana. It's a time-tested software 
and we have customized it for use in other states. Uh, but again, uh, we wanted to be clear, we wanted to be sure uh, that this software works fully and actually more than the software itself, it's the uh, human resource uh, issue around software that we should have people who know about the software and they can use it well. So we want to have a smooth launch, no hiccups, and that's why we've taken this time. But you're right, 40 days is not a, a long time and our clock is already started to tick and uh, we have uh, come in a, uh, almost like a uh, mission mode and we have a war room uh, that we've established and uh, we'll be uh, working day and night to uh, make yes. this happen. Um, as uh, we have spoken before as well, Mr. Bhushan, one of the key challenges is to identify enough hospitals uh, or, uh, you know, uh, medical centers with that many beds to effectively help people who are going to be part of this scheme. Uh, has there been any progress on that front? And can you clarify for us that right now at this pilot test stage, uh, will there be private uh, hospitals who are also participating? Uh, in the test stage, uh, it's largely the public hospitals who, have partic who are participating, uh, but the impanelment process for getting uh, private sector involved has already started. And uh, we have uh, actually opened the uh, impanelment um, uh, portal, and uh, already about 8,000 hospitals have started to apply. And uh, we hope to have this um, done very soon. Um, and uh, in terms of number of beds, uh, uh, Tamanna, as you can understand that we are targeting 50 crore people, and if on an average 2% uh, of them uh, need hospitalization, uh, we'll need about one crore, we'll have one crore uh, admissions. And if we say that uh, um, uh, about 200 um, uh, uh, bed days uh, can be there in uh, one hospital, uh, like uh, one, one bed can provide 200 uh, number of bed days, uh, we'll need uh, about uh, two lakh beds. And uh, already the number of uh, hospitals uh, which are com have come on board are about uh, close to about 60,000 60, beds. So we are reaching there and uh, we are very confident that by the end of this month we'll have uh, necessary number of beds uh, in place. Uh, but actually number of beds, um, is uh, not the problem. Uh, what I see a uh, long-term problem is that we need to have more beds in rural areas and tier two and tier three cities, and that will take some time. And uh, this is the promise and vision of the scheme that it will encourage and motivate and incentivize private sector to open more hospitals in lagging areas. All right, uh, it's now over to Shraddha Babla, who's joining us with the stocks in news. Shraddha, what are the stocks on your list today? I'm going to start off, uh, Alex, with Gati, and this is on the back of an ET report which says that all cargo logistics is in uh, talks to buy controlling stake in the company, so that's one that we'll be watching out for. Uh, lots of numbers that were reported after market hours. Weak set of numbers coming in from GMR Infra, where uh, revenues dipped by 34% and the net loss expanded uh, from 136 crores to 235 crores, and that also had a big impact on the margins, which came at 24.9%. Uh, more importantly, they have said that they have executed a settlement agreement with PE investors. This is specifically uh, for its airport arm. And additionally, they're also planning to raise a total of about 2,900 crores via equity or debt issuances. So watch out for that name. Cox and Kings is next on the list. Um, revenue growth of 14%, but the net profits are a big uh, decline of 56%. Uh, this is even as the operational performance was weak with EBITDA down 20% and other expenses during the quarter shot up very sharply. The NCLT has approved demerger of their forex division. We are also watching out for India Bulls real estate, while revenues grew by 38%, net profit dipped by 5%. This is even as uh, the operational performance of the company was weak, with the margins falling off uh, to just 30% as compared to 55%. And then finally, last on the list is Fortis Healthcare. Revenues uh, down by about 10%, and the net loss uh, for the quarter came in at 70 crores. That apart, the management has said that the shareholders have cleared IHH proposal to buy the company. So these are some of the names to watch out for. Thanks so much for that, Shraddha.
Now, in some sad news for Indian cricket fans, former India cap captain uh, Ajit Vadekar passed away uh, late last night after a prolonged illness. He was 77 years old. Vadekar led India to an historic series win in England and also in West Indies in the year 1971. A stylish left-handed batsman, Vadekar also scored over 2,000 runs over 37 test matches in a decade-long career. A winner of the Padma Shri, Vadekar was one of the few Indians to have served the country as captain, coach as well as the chairman of selectors. Now, apart from the Pad Padma Shri, Vadekar had also won a host of other awards including the Arjuna Award and the CK Naidu Award for Lifetime Achievement. Now, there's lots of stories that you'll find on the website and there's also live market action right here on a Bloomberg Quint Live. But here are just a couple of stories that you'll find if you log on to the website as of now. Reliance Industries has said in a regulatory filing that it has undertaken a shutdown of a unit at its petroleum refinery complex uh, operating at the Jamnagar Special Economic Zone in Gujarat. The company said that one of the fluid catalytic cracking units at the refinery, which can process over 500,000 barrels of crude per day will restart after two weeks though it didn't specify any reasons it said the rest of the refinery would function normally and the shutdown would not affect overall operations second story the reserve bank of india has started scrutiny of 200 large accounts to assess their level of stress and also the provisioning done against them the pti is reported quoting a senior public bank official that the central bank is examining whether banks have followed prudential norms with regard to these stressed assets now, just as more people uh, than ever are living near coastlines, climate change is making the storms that threaten them much more dangerous. Bloomberg takes a, a quick take, rather, explains what climate change has in store for these coastal cities and what, what they're doing to prepare. Hurricanes, typhoons, tropical cyclones. Whatever you call them in your part of the world, they're getting more intense, and the storm-driven water that they bring in particular is likely to cause bigger losses of property and life in the near future. A good example of what the future may hold was um, Hurricane Harvey last year that hit the Houston area and set brand new rainfall records all the way across Texas. Well, they set rainfall records for the United States. Some areas end up getting 50 inches of rain. In a warmer atmosphere, the atmosphere can actually carry more moisture. So the chances are that the storms will get 10 to 15 percent um, rainier. While these storms are known for wind and rain, they do the bulk of their damage through their storm surge, the walls of water they bulldoze onto coastal land. But that hasn't scared people away from shores. In fact, just the opposite. More people are living near the coast than ever before. If you were to draw a circle around the United States, the area that's most prone to get hit by a um, hurricane or a tropical storm, that would be the Gulf Coast of the United States. The U.S. Gulf Coast alone has seen its population surge 25% in just 16 years. This trend is concerning, and it's costly not just for the homeowner, but also the government and ultimately the taxpayer. You know, you own a piece of land that's on the beach. You have a beautiful view. I own it. I want to do whatever I want with it. You know, the government, on the other hand, they're the ones who are going to have to send in the fire department, the police department, the helicopter, the Coast Guard, whatever, to rescue you in case things go wrong. So they want to have a say in things. Um, on top of that, you also have insurance issues. You know, uh, in the U.S., flood insurance is a government-subsidized program. So people who don't live near the shore are, you know, de facto through their tax dollars subsidizing those people who do live near the shore. Thanks to the National Flood Insurance Program, policies for homeowners cost about half of what will be the true market rate. But relocating families to higher ground is also expensive. It will cost the U.S. government $48 million to relocate two dozen families in Louisiana. That's why some cities and countries are harnessing technology to try to defend against storm surges. Tokyo built a massive underground flood diversion facility, and New York is planning a system of walls and levees to prevent damage from future storms. There's certainly no time to waste, as climate change is supercharging the strongest storms on Earth. All right, that's all we have for you in this edition of Daybreak, but all you need to know is up next, so do stay tuned. This is Bloomberg Quint.